Thanks, Sushil. Uh, there'll be some overlap in the slides that I showed and Sushil showed, so uh, I apologize for that. But uh, my focus is going to really, in 15 minutes, talk about what is durability, what are the expectations, and where are we going? Can we switch to the slides now, please? So these are uh, actually, you know what? Let me back to this one. Yeah. So this is the background. The problem is the data is really hard to truly interpret because definitions of durability thus far have not been standardized. And to really understand this, as Sushil pointed out, you need long-term follow-up. Both the uh, low-risk studies now have mandated echocardiographic follow-up for 10 years, and that's sort of going to get us more information as we move forward. However, we've known based on surgical history, that all bioprosthetic valves are not created equally. We've had mitral flows that were used uh, in vogue for a while with a uh, median life of 3.8 years before they fail. We had valves like the Toronto valve, which is a freestyle valve, and older valves like the INS Cushelli valve, which all had very high midterm failure rates in spite of showing a lot of hemodynamic promise when they first came out. We do know that all current generation tower valves are made with similar materials as surgical valves and now are potentially going to be treated with similar type of anti-calcification treatments like the surgical valves have been. And another intriguing idea is this patient prosthetic mismatch 
and that frequently mimics structural valve deterioration because both entities have high gradients and, uh, and low effective orifice areas. And the last but not the least is that structural valve deterioration, although can be likened to be a binary 20 millimeter jump in gradient from a previously known echo, but it's really a continuous variable rather than just a categorical variable. So what we're really talking about is an intrinsic abnormality with deterioration of the leaflets or the supporting structures, either due to thickening, calcification, tearing, or disruption, which ultimately leads to hemodynamic dysfunction. These are some examples. Uh, on A and D, you see tears on the left ventricular and aortic side, respectively. On the right panel on the top, you see a heavily calcified uh, magna ease. And then in panel C, you see a metronic engager valve with, uh, with severe leaflet calcification and restriction. So again, so we all speak the same language here. What we're really talking about is bioprosthetic valve dysfunction, uh, which can be divided into four categories. One can be the structural valve deterioration, which is what we're going to focus on. Then you have non-structural valve deterioration, either related to the valve moving or due to patient prosthetic mismatch, or due to uh, a paravalvular leak, which has nothing to do with structural valve deterioration. And then you have other problems like leaflet thrombosis and endocarditis, which are not the focus of our talk today. So uh, we need to thank uh, Danny DeVere uh, for uh, his work in this field to come up with some sort of a standardized definition and dividing them into stage 0, 1, 2, and 2R, 2RS, 2S, and then stage 3. Uh, I won't go into uh, the details of the classification. Suffice to state that stage 2, the S stands for stenosis, R stands for regurgitation, RS stands for both regurg and stenosis. And stage 3 is when it gets really serious with gradients that are in the severe range for both either stenosis or regurgitation. These are the classic echocardiographic parameters. Of course, I won't bore you with the long and the short, but the bottom line I want to really want you to focus on is this need to re-emphasize the body surface area aspect of these effective orifice areas. And so a, a large man with a body surface area greater than 1.6 meters squared has numbers that are different than a little lady with a body surface area of less than 1.6. And that's something to consider when we look at and describe these entities. The other piece of the problem that is really not uh, clear in the literature is the fact that surgical valves really had never been studied with the same degree of detail like we've done with our transcatheter valves. The most commonly reported measure of surgical valve durability is this term called freedom from structural valve deterioration. And what that really means is freedom from either severe AS or AR, or freedom from a repeat operation. Obviously, a lot of patients with severe disease may never have an operation, or may have died before they got to the point where they were recognized to have this problem. So the issue is that this approach of freedom from structural valve deterioration clearly underestimates the real incidence of structural valve deterioration. However, we know that there are hypothetical reasons for reduced transcatheter heart valve durability. Some are related to the device. Some are related to deployment of how we crimp these valves. And the other may be related to just the interaction between the device and the annulus, because unlike surgical valves, we are not really decalcifying the native leaflet. And there's opportunity for interaction that's unfavorable between the transcatheter heart valve and the native aortic annulus due to asymmetric expansion. As Sushil demonstrated earlier, the stent tip deflection that he was talking about, all of which can lead to potentially concerns about reduced durability. This is, again, a slide that he showed where you had uh, accelerated fatigue and high stress uh, demonstrated at uh, asymmetric points on the valve leaflets, as demonstrated by Mark Minson in their Journal of Biomechanical Engineering. Again, this is elastin fragmentation and an uncrimped control. Uh, and here you have uh, the disarray of elastin. Can you see 
very clearly after you crimp these valves. This is a slide that Sushil demonstrated earlier that looked at this whole entity that was first described by Carlos Ruiz and, and reported by Raj Makar uh, as part of the Portico study and then since been duplicated in most other valves where you have an incidence that we're not really sure what the incidence of it is, but roughly in the 5 to 10 percent range with some association with neurologic events. As you can see, this reduced leaflet motion is seen with all types of valves, both transcatheter as well as surgical valves. And it's usually picked up on a 4D CT. And anticoagulation was, was associated with resolution of this thrombus uh, in the majority of the patients, as can be shown very nicely in the images on the right. So do these hypothetical concerns clinically make a difference is a real question. And uh, this is another slide that Sushil demonstrated that TAVI and surgery essentially have similar safety and freedom from long-term outcomes, barring the earlier risk for stroke, uh, bleeding, AFib, and acute kidney injury from surgery. But overall, the outcomes from a time to event analysis are, are, are essentially the same. Similarly, when you look at partner five-year data, looking at the cohort A patients, again, there really wasn't any structure about deterioration that required re-intervention out to five years with mean gradients demonstrating a nice decline and staying low in that 10 to 20 millimeter range. Similarly, the valve areas didn't show any decrement and increased from 0.6 at baseline to roughly in the 1.5 to 1.8 range. And we didn't lose any ground over a five-year period on follow-up in the partner trial. Similarly, in the superannular SIRT-HAVI data from the core valve you see similarly uh, better valve performance than even the surgical valves with uh, valve areas in the 2.1 range and gradients in the below the 10 range. We also know that TAVR is clearly associated with less of patient prosthetic mismatch than surgical ABR, and this was demonstrated both in the partner studies as well as by Zorn et al. in the core valve high-risk privilege study. So since Elaine Cribier did the first transcatheter heart valve in 2002, we've come 16 years. His site in Rouen, France, looked at the assessment of structural valve deterioration uh, in balloon expandable valves using the new European consensus document that just came out. And they found that over time in their experience, which is a single center experience of several patients up to eight years, there was similar increments in both mean gradient and aortic valve area as seen in the partner and the core valve studies. And the patients that, and a lot of the patients had in excess of 90% freedom from structural valve deterioration out to eight years. However, the patients that did show structural valve deterioration had one common feature. They all have patients with renal failure, just similar to the data you would see with surgical valves. Similar to what has been known in clinical practice in the vivid registry, Danny DeVere very elegantly demonstrated that surgical valves also have had a median time to require reintervention for TAVR with a median time of only 10 years with a clear bell-shaped curve. And uh, similar to what I said earlier, some of these valves deteriorated much earlier and the others sort of had a uh, much longer time to failure. So in summary, what would be a clinical approach to structural valve deterioration in 2018? I think stage zero, one, and two warrant close follow-up and repeat echocardiography, especially once you start getting into stage two with mixed disease and stage three is when you really start considering re-intervention, especially in patients who have symptoms. This is data from the STS ACC TVT registry, which looked at the multivariate logistic regression model of what the potential predictors might be for hemodynamic deterioration. And what we found was that male patients with larger body surface areas that, under had, that underwent TAVR with small valves, or who had valve and valve implantations, or who had patient prosthetic mismatch, were at risk for potentially developing structural valve deterioration sooner than others. So what would be our take home message? My take home message from this talk would be that bioprosthetic tissue valves, whether they're surgical or tower valves, are both associated with valve deterioration. Most implanted tissue valves can be treated 
with a less invasive approach, most commonly a valve and valve. Of course, with the caveat that outcomes in smaller sized valve and valves are much different than the larger sized valves. Intermediate and high risk older patients, like they have been in the United States, should be safely and effectively treated with TALR. However, in the low risk patients and younger patients, and especially in those with some of the things that Sushil talked about, like bicuspids, et cetera, uh, should be not treated until we have better data, awaiting the results of P3 and the low risk COVAP study, which we should have within the next year. Until then, surgery would still remain the gold standard. Thanks for your attention. It's a great opening you know, presentation. I think it's a time we move on. And uh, Dr. Gupta couldn't make it. And uh, Dr. Rodriguez has kindly agreed to fill in and, and give his talk on an update on percutaneous mitral valve repair and replacement. Hey, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, discuss some of the uh, new mitral technologies, and in order to do that, I'm just going <coughs> to kind of look at the mitral valve quickly and then just show that compared to the aortic valve, it's a little bit more complex, and basically we can divide it into four different areas. There's the uh, annulus, the leaflets, the subvalvular apparatus, and the ventricles. So if you're talking about technologies to address the mitral valve, they can address any of these components and of course the total mitral valve replacement would address uh, the majority of them. Just to put things in perspective, if you look uh, uh, three summers ago, uh, Edwards uh, spent $400 million buying Cardio AQ, Abbott bought Sophia and Pendine, Medtronic then bought 12 for $458 million. And then hardware spent $800 million for Valtec, which then actually that deal fell apart and eventually uh, Edwards acquired that technology. But that was, uh, and then Boston Scientific went ahead and bought uh, Enval, and now they have bought uh, Millipede. But that was around $2, $2 billion, just to put things in perspective of, compared to the aortic market, the micro is a much bigger market and the companies are investing more into that. A few years, uh, around two years ago, I kind of looked at the list of all the uh, transcatheter valve technologies that are in development. These are the ones that people know about them. And um, when you look at this, uh, I'll just go through them, basically. It's around 40-something technologies plus the ones that we don't know about, and this is just a few years ago. So again, there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to see in this space. So the way I separate it, I just go by different levels of addressing. This is what we call a technology to address the annual as an annuloplasty. This would be an indirect annuloplasty device. The only one on the market is really this uh, Carillon, uh, has CE mark, and there's a study that is going in the U.S. And basically, they approach the coronary sinus to try to cinch the uh, microannulus via that way. Uh, they have been. These are all the uh, the trials for uh, Carillon. The problem with this is that it doesn't work in, in a significant number of patients, and the main reason for that is that the relationship between the coronary sinus and the mitral annulus in most patients, uh, it's around nine millimeters plus minus two. So very few patients have a perfect anatomy for this type of technology. However, if you choose the proper patient by either <clears throat> cardiac MRI or other technologies, you may be able to help them with this technology. Again, I don't think it's going to be a big part of the future. So the other option is to go and do a direct percutaneous aneuroplasty device, and really the only one uh, currently in the, in the US uh, and, and Europe is the microline. Uh, and microline, let me see how I can cut the sound on this. But basically, the way it works is uh, uh, you're able to go across, get a needle, um, and then there's going to be a, uh, uh, a little uh, pledge that goes in. And basically, what you end up doing is a little annuloplasty, like uh, what we in surgery call the K annuloplasty. But you end up pinching the annulus in different levels. 
to kind of uh, create an aneuploplasty, and you put as many of those as you need. Uh, this is kind of, this technology in the mitral has kind of stopped, and this is what they're using, that trial line that they showed before, that is this uh, for the tricuspid valve. CardioBand is the valve tech technology. Edwards has acquired this. They are going with a clinical trial in the U.S. Uh, called, um, uh, where's it, Active or so. And uh, basically, um, this is a technology that allows uh, to put an annuloplasty, so transeptal, so transfemoral vein, transeptal, going to the annulus, and then you'll anchor this band from kind of trigon to trigon. You cannot put a complete band. This will basically get into the aortic valve and other structures. But for the most part, you can go and it has this little screws, and you screw in this as you go around. And then at the end, you can cinch it under uh, echo guidance uh, to get the effect. It has different sizes, so you select the size, and then depending on how much reduction you want of the annulus. Microclip is probably the most advanced technology or the one with the most experience. There's over 50,000 microclips uh, deployed. And in the U.S., it's the fastest growing uh, technology. Um, there is a new clip. Uh, this is the old one. The new one is the uh, NP. And now there's an, a newer clip, which is bigger, um, uh, uh, with uh, longer uh, 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 arms. But basically, the technology is uh, you go device, and then this is a combination of floral and echo, but the majority of the procedure is TE guidance. So again, you're going transeptal, regular transeptal uh, uh, approach, microclip comes down, and then uh, you deploy this, uh, you, on, on the record you can see it coming down now from the left atrium into the left ventricle, you start pulling back, and then you grab the leafless. Once you're happy with those, with that grasping, then you close it on their floral, and then you see the mitral re, uh, regurgitation reduction. You make an assessment for mitral stenosis, no significant mitral stenosis. You let the clip go, and then you decide whether you need another one or not. And most people, the average clip is around 1.8 to 2 now. Uh, there's uh, uh, been a, a little bit more clips as we do more cases. And then you end up with a double orifice. And uh, once you uh, are happy with the result, you detach it, and that's that's kind of the, the result you get, and you get reassessed again for micro regurgitation as well as for microstenosis. There are some limitations with this, uh, really calcified valves. Uh, you have to have good leaflets, and um, you can not, and your mitral valve area has to be of a significant area to begin with. This is one of our cases, two clips, um, and you can see the clips put here. The reason we have this specimen, this was a bridge to transplantation. We put two clips, recover the patient, the patient got a transplant afterwards. There is a new clip by Edwards, it's called Pascal. It is basically similar, but it has two little spacers in between, so when you deploy the clip, it has like a little filling uh, in between. There's gonna be a trial in the US looking at Pascal randomizing patients uh, against um, the microclip patients. Neocore technology is, uh, uh, a technology where you go uh, transeptal and then you basically place a cord to the leaflet that is prolapsing. So it has a needle. Uh, you, you grab the leaflet and there's a needle that goes through and then you bring it out of the apex. This is approved in Europe. They have CE mark and in the U.S. there's a trial with this. And basically the approach is through a left mini thoracotomy, beating hard. You put two first strings and then you basically go with the device, go transapical, you go up to the, towards the mitral valve and during with um, echo guidance, then you uh, grab the leaflets. Um, and I'll show you. So here's the device going across, goes into the left atrium. And on 3D, which is the best kind of views that you can get, you rotate the device so you can grab the leaflet. The device has these lights that they change from red to white. When you have all four white lights, that means that you have a good grasping of the leaflet. And then you pass the needle. 
you get your your cords out and then you tie them on their floor. I'm sorry, on their echo guidance. And then um, the key with this is that you want to overcompensate. So you actually want to bring the leaflet further down, almost that you have a little bit of MR. And the reason is as the ventricle remodels and the ventricle shrinks, those cords would be too long if you don't make them a little extra short. And at the end, you end up with something like this. In the US, that trial is going to be only for patients with A2 and P2 prolapse alone. The Harpoon technology is basically similar to the, um, to, to the NeoCore. Uh, the difference with this is that you can see here, there's uh, instead of just being the core that goes with uh, one needle, the core goes here, comes here. Here has like a little pledget or a buttress, and that is just to have a little bit more grasping of the leaflet. And again, the same thing, they come out of the uh, apex of the heart, and the apex you can tie them. The harpoon has a delivery system through the apex where you don't bleed as much as you do with the, with the uh, neocore system. This is uh, going, uh, finishing C mark uh, trials, and then they're gonna start a trial in the US probably in another year or so. Cardio Solutions Facer, I, this is off the market, but it's basically like the Forma, which is the device that they show for the tricuspid, but for the mitral, the problem with this is they were having too much uh, clot formation and thromboembolism, so this was only in animals. The only ventricular remodeling device that we have is, is one for the uh, colic coapsis, uh, which is actually in humans was stopped, and then this marginal base. But again, what it is is like you basically put this little wrap around and then you can inflate this little um, little gadgets that shrink the ventricle. Again, this is only in a, I think there's one clinical trial. I don't know where this is going. I don't think there's a, a lot of activity in this trial. And obviously the, 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 the big push is for the, the trans catheter mitral valve repair just to reproduce what we have done with the aortic valve. This is some of the devices that are uh, available. I'm just going to show you the four that are in clinical trials now in the U.S. Uh, the Cardio AQ, which is the one that was bought by Edwards. Advantage of this is they have transeptal technology. Um, 12, which is now the Intrepid trial, which is the Metronic valve. Tendine, which is Abo and Kaysen. Um, the, um, the Tendine, all these three are transapical. Cardio AQ is coming with a uh, transeptal, and Intrepid is also coming with a transeptal. Kaysen uh, is already transeptal. Uh, the tendine has this little little gadget that gets anchored into the apex of the uh, ventricle, um, and um, it fixes the valve in place. I'll just show you one of them. This is an animation of the Kaysen uh, valve, and the reason I'm showing this is just so, again, this is transeptal. And this is a modular system. It has two devices. So you basically put the anchoring device first, and then you put the valve. Uh, so you go transeptal, sort of like you do for a microclip. You come in, your wire is in the ventricle. This is that anchoring device. The anchoring device is going to be deployed on the valve. And then it has these hooks that come underneath the leaflets. And the other key of this thing of this valve is that it has a device to grab that anterior leaflet of the mitral valve to prevent SAM. Because one of the problems with this valve is that as you push that anterior leaflet, you would end up with SAM. So um, you have your anchoring device, then you're going to come with your, and then you see this has to be kind of underneath where those uh, uh, commissures are. So now the anchoring device is in place, then you come with your valve. And again, the valve gets some sheets. Right now they have three sizes, they're coming with more sizes. All of these valves, the limitation is the sizes uh, and the delivery systems. Those, so here you have the valve, and then you'll see here is the anterior leaflet of the native valve. And this is the one now you're going to hook that and then you bring it away from the outflow track. 
delivery systems on all the other transapicals are around anywhere between 32 and 35 frames. So it's a pretty big system. That's pretty much it. Thank you. So, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip uh, my talk for now and move on to the next next session. If there's time or something, I can, I can talk about that. So, I'll try to bring sure. Bill again uh, in April. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Amit. He's going to talk about the be here coronary obstruction uh, of displaced prosthesis during Tabby. Great. Welcome. Thank you. Slides. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for this invitation. And I slightly modified the talk in in the interest because uh, coronary obstruction due to displaced prosthesis is a very rare condition. In fact, so I thought, like, why not discuss about the coronary obstruction in a whole? And that uh, assumes more importance than you know just talking about the displaced prosthesis. Aortic stenosis, if I have to tell, then it's a kind of genetic condition in which there is some amount of uh, uh, aortic remodeling and there is longitudinally, the longitudinal diameter is decreased. So if you see in aortic stenosis, what happens is this certains, the coronary height decreases. And this may be one of the reasons why uh, coronary obstructions can occur because of the Either it may be because of the prostatis skirt or because of the leaflet movement or because of the calcium. We know that uh, I'll be talking about two valves mainly, uh, the Edward valve and the metronic valve. The metronic valve, we know that uh, the height of the prostatis is almost like 45 and the height of the skirt ranges from 12 to 13 millimeter. And the depth that is required to be maintained is 3 to 5 millimeters. So if we see, the height of the coronary should be something around 10 millimeter so as not to close the coronaries with uh, the skirt of the valve. But this is not the only mechanism by which coronary obstruction occurs. Now if we see the valve sits in the, in the, in the annulus in this uh, way and we can see that this is the sinotubular junction, height of the sinotubular junction, this is the height of the coronaries and this is the sinus of Vesalva. So even if the skirt is like the skirt comes until here, the filling of the coronaries occurs in diastole. So if the sinus of the sylva is roomy, then the blood can easily flow and there won't be any closure of the coronaries. At the same time, if we see that if the sinus tubular junction height is well uh, above the limit of uh, 15 millimeter, then also if the sinus of the sylva is not uh, is quite roomy and the coronary height is less than 10 millimeters, the closure is not going to happen. The third thing that we need to note is about the leaflet, the movement of the leaflet while the valve is being deployed. Now, if the, the valve when it the, is deployed, the leaflet comes, comes in this direction and if there is a heavy amount of calcium on the leaflet, there is a tendency that the leaflet may fall back, also be pulled by the coronary pressure, negative coronary pressure and chance of closure of the coronaries could be there. So these are some of the important things that we need to keep in mind while we are thinking about uh, doing case, uh, a case. So similarly, if we go for an Edward valve, then, then the whole measurement again comes down to something like the coronary height of uh, 10 millimeter as well as the sinus of the silva diameter and STJ, STJ uh, height remains the same. In case uh, we are too confused about uh, whether the coronary is going to get closed or not, then what we can do is, like, uh, like it has been done over here, while we are doing a valvotomy, pre-valvotomy, you can just do an iotogram and see if the coronaries are getting closed or not. If the coronaries are getting closed by the movement of the valve, by the movement of the leaflet, then you need to take a special care, that is you may put a, uh, you may wire the coronary, put a, uh, stent prior into the coronary and uh, when deploy the valve, if the coronary gets closed, you can just pull back the stent and deploy the stent. That's called as coronary protection over here. I'll just show a few cases uh, 
and uh, that will clarify more clarify uh, us how the coronary gets closed and why not. There was an 83 years old male, high STS score and your score. Uh, he had low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis and uh, balloon atrial valvotomy was performed six weeks back. We looked at the functional status and the patient made a dramatic improvement, so we decided to go for uh, TAVI. This patient had normal coronaries at the time of balloon atrial valvotomy. Now, you look at the CT, it's 24.9 perimeter derived diameter, a lot of calcium in the sinus of Vesalva, as well as in the LV, LVOT. The calcium extends into the LVOT as well. If we see the whole of the annulus is uh, calcified, aortic valve is calcified. These are very high risk cases to do. When you see the height of the coronary, the left coronary height is quite good enough and at the same time you can see that the calcium is extending into the LVOT over here. In the right side you can see the calcium extends right into the cusp and almost reaches up to the ostium of the right coronary. The height of the right coronary was 9.6. But we thought like the sinus vessel was quite roomy and the height of the STJ was quite good. So we thought, okay, we can get away. But at the same time, we kept in mind that there could be an sounds of annular rupture. So we decided to go for a metronic valve in this case. A uh, metronic valve was deployed and you can see after just after the deployment, there was ST elevation in 2-3 AVF. And you can see a lot of uh, chunk of uh, calcium sitting out of there. You cannot see the right coronary artery at all. Immediately, uh, angiogram, selective angiogram was done and you can see that the ostium of the right coronary artery has got occluded. Immediately it was wired, ballooned and this was uh, initially I thought like okay if it, ballooning can help, just help it then I'm going to leave it but it did not help so I had to stand this segment and post this standing there was a good result. So here you can see that it is the amount of calcium in the right coronary because and the leaflet calcium. The height of the coronary was also less. These were the major factors due to which the coronaries got occluded. Let me show you another case. Uh, this was uh, another high risk case, uh, treated case of uh, CA prostate. And uh, he had undergone PTCA uh, to LMCA to LAD and LCX through bifurcation lesion, mid uh, RCA PTCA, the high Euro score. The gradient were pretty high, decided to do TAVI. You can see in this case itself uh, also that there is a large amount of calcium present. On the right side, the calcium extends into the cusp as well as uh, below. On the left side, the coronary height is okay. non coronary cusps look fine. We did not expect any kind of problem in this, uh, in this case, particularly uh, like I, until now, I don't know why this problem occurred in this case. As soon as the valve was deployed, the patient was shifted uh, to the ICU, but uh, the patient developed uh, hypotension and uh, required anotropic support, so he was shifted back to cath lab. There was also ST elevation V1 to V6 and AVR. So you can see a selective angiogram. There was some haziness over there, so decided to, the right was normal. Uh, the coronaries were wired, and now you can see the thrombus formation right at the ostium of the left main and the circumflex is closed. So went ahead, did dilated the circumflex first, did a kissing dilatation over there. Since it was already stented, decided not to stent any of these arteries, but uh, decided to stent the circumflex because uh, the circumflex was a new occlusion without anything. So they do, finally there was a good result, the patient did well later on. This is uh, another case, I'm going to give a couple of cases with uh, sepian valve. Now you can see a lot of calcium in the left coronary cups extends into the normal coronary cups. When you measure the distance between, uh, between the cusp uh, and the leaflet and the height of the coronary, both were 16 millimeter, high likelihood of closer. This case I picked up uh, from uh, some uh, other friend of mine. And uh, you can see just after the implantation of the, of the valve, there was closure of this uh, left main. Immediately it was, uh, plasty was done with 4 into 12 millimeter of drugulating stent and uh, there was no damage. But here again you can see it was because of the uh, large amount of calcium that was present in the, in the left coronary cusp and the non-coronary cusp. 
Again, here you can see the valve was deployed, but when you see uh, carefully, the valve was slightly at the level of the annulus and uh, probably with a lot of hemodynamic uh, uh, things going over here, the, the coronary got closed immediately. It was uh, plastic 4 into 12 millimeter stent and, and the patient did well. So here it is mainly because the prostatis uh, here was slightly higher than the annulus not maintaining the 12, 25% uh, of depth that has to be there. These are some unusual cases. This I picked up from the journals and you can see that uh, this coronary, uh, the patient had a uh, paravalvular leak and the leak was closed with uh, AVP2. Just after the closer, the, the operators did uh, IBUS and they found that the slit was uh, narrowed with the uh, uh, so they just went ahead and blasted the case. So it is a case where there was coronary obstruction because of the AB2 valve that was used for paravalvular leak closure. This is a very interesting case. Again, I picked up from the net this also. This is uh, like uh, the guy underwent uh, Tavi about uh, six months back and then he developed uh, severe uh, hypotension. During hypotension, there was ST elevation in 2-3 AVF uh, as well as global ST elevation. So the patient was brought into the hospital. The patient had already stabilized. When iatogram was done, everything was fine. Now you can see over here in the CT that this is clearly a supraannular valve which extends right above the coronaries. This is another case uh, because of the pseudoaneurysm formed uh, while uh, post dilatation. Uh, intravalvular uh, intra annular uh, pseudoaneurysm which went on to obstruct the left main and uh, the patient refused any kind of intervention in this case. Uh, the patient was discharged and finally expired after a week. While we consider valve in valve, two things has to be considered like what the surgeon has done, whether it is an intraannular valve or whether it is a supraannular valve. If it is a supraannular valve, the height of coronaries would have decreased itself. So there is a, there is a high chance that the coronary might get closed. So it is better to use a retrievable valve, whichever you are using. And if the coronaries get closed, just retrieve the valve and think of another way of uh, uh, making the patient rather than uh, you just uh, going ahead with TAVI. If it is an intraannular, then the chance of closure is quite low. So to summarize, the chance of coronary uh, occlusion depends upon degree of calcification of the leaflet, annulus to coronary osteo distance, length of the valve leaflet, width of the sinus of S alba, height of sinus tubular junction, movement of the leaflets during balloon atrial valvotomy, potency of coronaries during balloon at, uh, aortic valvotomy, expanded uh, height of the intended uh, valve, and whether the if if we are doing a valve in valve case, then whether the surgeon has put an intraannular or a supraannular valve, all these things needs to be considered when you are doing the TAVI in regard to coronaries. Thank you very much. Any questions?